Hey guys, what's up? It's Raven. Fun fact, Goofy, like the Disney character Goofy who hangs out with Mickey Mouse, is not a dog. He's not a dog. He's a cow. Because why would a dog have a pet dog who looks different than him? Pluto is his pet and Pluto is definitely a dog, but Goofy is not a dog. He's a cow. And if you don't believe me, look it up. But on another note, today we are going to be talking about mental health. And before I jump into it, I do have to give a disclaimer that I have a snotty nose right now, okay? I'm very congested, so if you can hear it in my voice, if you can hear it in my nose, I'm so sorry, but I did not need yet another excuse to not record a podcast episode because it has been 14, 11 years since I've recorded an episode, and I do apologize for that. I've seen you guys, your your messages, your comments, asking for a new podcast episode, um, I don't have a good excuse as to why I haven't had one, but now, of course, I finally get the time and I get the motivation and I get the inspiration and the will to finally record an episode and boom, I'm congested. So whatever, we're just powering through. Hopefully it's not too bothersome, but yes, in this episode, we're going to be discussing my mental health journey, I guess, if you want to call it that. Um, I basically just kind of wanted to give you guys a life, a life backstory, giving you guys a complete rundown and breakdown from as long ago as I can remember um, and telling you guys about my struggles with my mental health, my diagnosis disease and um, what I've tried to do to help with my mental health, what has worked for me, what has not worked for me, what some of my main struggles have been, what some of my lowest moments have been, and just kind of give you guys that whole backstory so that you know where I'm coming from and just kind of what my personal story is because everybody's struggle with mental health, everybody's journey with mental health is so different and unique to them, unique to their life experiences, unique to their traumas that they have gone through. You know what I mean? So I think you can't really fully have that discussion with someone until you know their personal backstory with it. Because for me to just say, hey, I struggle with depression. I have an anxiety disorder. I sometimes have panic attacks. For me to just tell you those um, blanket labels that doesn't really tell you specifically what I'm struggling with and why. And I think the conversation is really shallow when you just leave it at that and you don't really know like the backstory behind it. So I really want to be able to have deeper conversations with you guys. So that's why I want to really open up and really be vulnerable and give you guys my full backstory. So starting from the way, way back, my earliest memory, um, basically, I would say my first memory when it comes to anything mental health related would probably be in middle school. I think um, middle school is just a tough time because you're going through puberty and it's just a lot going on. Middle school is tough for a lot of people for a lot of reasons. And I am no different. But for me, you know, I was in middle school, what, 2000 and I think from 2005 to 2008, no, 2004 to 2007, I think, is when I was in middle school. So back in the day, back in the early 2000s, okay, social media was not what it is today. Access to all types of information on the internet wasn't necessarily like it is today. It's not like today where you go on any social media platform and everybody is discussing mental health. That information just was not being shared. People were not sharing their stories. Um, We also weren't even like learning about it in school. I don't think at all from what I remember. So I was not aware of what it really means to have depression, to be depressed, to have anxiety, panic attacks. I was not educated or aware of all these things in middle school from what I can remember. If I was, it was a very surface level thing. So I didn't have the knowledge or the resources or the exposure or other people's stories, whether it be in real life or on social media. I didn't have any of that around me to be able to kind of like self-diagnose myself or help myself. So in the moment, I didn't know what was going on with me at all. I didn't know if there was something wrong with me, if there wasn't, is this normal? Is this not normal? Am I just a crybaby? Am I just sensitive? Like I literally did not know what was going on with me. Now looking back on it, 
thinking back as a 28 year old, thinking back to my 12, 13 year old self, I now can see, oh, you were struggling with depression and anxiety. You just didn't know it at the time. And the reason why I say that is because I remember being 11, 12, 13 years old and just having these really intensely negative emotions that seemed like they were just happening for no reason. That's my first memory when it comes to anything mental health related is just having really intense like crying fits where I would just bawl my eyes out. I would close myself up in my room and just bawl my eyes out. And it would either be caused by something really small that sent me down a really big downward spiral for some reason, or it would come out of literally nowhere. Like nothing is wrong. Nothing is happening. I just, for some reason today, I feel horrible, like inside myself, inside my head, inside my heart. I just feel horrible. I just feel like I need to cry. I feel like I just want to be balled up in my bed. I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to be like out in public. Like I just remember having those really intense feelings, not knowing what it was, not knowing how to fix it, not really wanting to tell anyone about it because I felt like a weirdo for it. But those are my first memories. Then my first big trigger, I guess, or my first, um, uh, I don't know if I want to call it trauma because trauma feels like too much of a harsh word for it. But when I went from middle school to high school, it was, it was traumatizing for me because I had gone to a really small private school from um, elementary all through middle school, I went to the same little small private school. And I was very, it was very much like my comfort zone. And my parents kind of told me at the last minute, actually for high school, you're not going to private school, you're going to public school. And that really, really scared me. I think going from middle school to high school is just scary in general. You know what I mean? Like a lot of kids struggle with that no matter what the circumstances are because it's like ooh high school so scary whatever whatever but for me this particular move from my comfortable small little sheltered private school to this big old scary public school where I was not going to know anyone none of my friends were going to be going there and I was already like a naturally shy anxious person anyway and already I think dealing with depression and anxiety without knowing it that news just sent me just, it was traumatic. Like it literally caused me to have a panic attack. Now I know it was a panic attack in the moment. I didn't know what it was, but I had multiple panic attacks just over the summer, just thinking about, Oh my God, I have to go to this high school. Like just being so worked up about it. And yes, anxiety is normal. Everybody has anxiety. Everybody um, is anxious from time to time. Being anxious is a normal human emotion. Just because you are anxious sometimes, that doesn't mean that you have a disorder. That doesn't mean that you need to see a therapist or be medicated. The feeling of being anxious is normal. Like I said, every kid, when they go from middle school to high school, like you get anxious. But for me, it was to the extreme. It was to the point of just having these huge breakdowns. I remember I would have these breakdowns in my room where I just could not catch my breath. And now, again, looking back on it, I know that that was a panic attack. Just crying so hard, can't breathe. My heart is beating out of my chest. My body is trembling. I'm shaking, shivering, just like having like this weird, like painful numbing feeling in my head, just my body going into fight or flight mode. And like, it it gets worse because then I'm freaking myself out because I can't breathe, which is making me freak out even more. And then it's just like this uh, spiraling domino effect of just having these hyperventilating, screaming, crying, like, literally just so intense, so physically intense. And in the moment, like, I feel like it was looked at as like, oh, you're just so sensitive. You're so sensitive. You're a crybaby. You're overreacting. Like, you just need to calm down. Like, you just need to get a grip. Like, it was looked at more of like a personality flaw rather than a mental disorder. 
Um, because at the time, like my parents, they never said anything to me along the lines of like, oh, well, maybe you need to like go see a therapist. Maybe you need to be evaluated. Maybe there's something bigger going on here. Like they never said that. They just like kind of, mm, I don't know. They kind of were more so saying things along the lines of like, just try to relax, just try to relax, just try to calm down. Like, what are you even so worked up about in the first place? Like they didn't really treat it as a, as an emergency, you know, mental health, we need to go get help type of thing. It was just like, oh, she's just really sensitive about this topic. But what really sent it over the edge um, and what really, I think from what I remember kind of changed my parents' mind and made them look at it more like a serious thing was when not only did they tell me that I have to go to this high school, but on top of going to this high school, they were very adamant about me getting involved in some sort of something. So they really wanted me to play a sport. And the only sport that I had ever played um, in my past was volleyball, but I sucked at it. I hated it. Sports have just never been my thing. I briefly played it, but it was never something that I wanted to continue doing. But since it was the only thing that I had done before, they were like, okay, you're going into high school. You're not going to know anybody there. It's really important for you to get involved. So we want you to try out for the high school volleyball team. And that just was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I cannot even handle the idea of attending this high school. Now you're going to make me try out for a sport on top of that. And it sounds silly now. It sounds silly and I can laugh about it now. But in the moment when I tell you that was like, the worst thing that they could ever ask me to do. I felt so, again, it was beyond just feeling nervous. It was beyond just feeling anxious. It was to the point of literally panicking because for me, that was just really a trigger. Like that really triggered my anxiety. Um, Just the thought of having to show up at this new school with this new coach and these new girls and have to try out in front of everybody, try out for a sport that I know I'm horrible at, that I know I'm going to look stupid. I'm probably not going to make the team. You're going to make me go in front of all these people. And I even if I do make the team, I don't want to be on the team. Like that'll be even worse. I hope I don't make the team. Like so many thoughts immediately started rushing through my head. And I just I remember like. Like when my mom first, I remember it like it was yesterday when my mom first like really told me like, no, you have to do this. We were in my bedroom. We were sitting on my bed and she was like, you have to do this. And I was trying to explain to her like, I don't want to. And she was like, well, you have to. And I remember just like in that moment having a panic attack and just hyperventilating and crying. And oh my God. And I remember her looking at me like, are you good, bro? Like this is an extreme reaction. And I remember her saying something to me and just being very like, whoa, like, okay, this is, this is a bit much. And from what I remember from that point on, then my parents started treating my emotions. They started taking it a little bit more seriously. It started to be like, okay, well maybe maybe this is something bigger. Maybe this is more than you just being sensitive. Maybe there's something going on here and we should, you know, take you to a counselor or a therapist or something like that. And I think I also maybe at that point had started to become a little bit more educated about mental health stuff and started to kind of like self-diagnose myself because at that point, like I was on MySpace, I was on Tumblr and Tumblr, I know Tumblr back in the day was definitely the conversation of mental health and all types of disorders and things like that, that was definitely a hot topic on Tumblr. So I think that's probably where I was getting some of my information from. And I was able to start kind of actually putting my feelings into words and say, I think I have depression. I think I'm, I have anxiety and actually be able to like put those labels on it. And maybe I said that to my parents. I don't remember exactly. I do know that at that time, I was really good about um, literally writing letters to my parents because I really struggled to talk about serious things with them. I really struggled. Like I just had a lot of anxiety. And like at the time, I did not know that that's what it was. But now I know like I had a lot of anxiety about a lot of things. I had a lot of anxiety about just even trying to have a conversation with my parents 
So I would have to get a piece of paper and a pen and write down what I wanted to say. And I would fold it up and slide it under my mom's, um, her office door, because at the time she would like work from home. And I remember like I would slide it under her door and then run away. And that was any time that I needed to like tell her anything. I would do stuff like that instead of just knocking on the door and being like, hey, can I talk to you? And it wasn't like my parents were hard to talk to for any major reason. Like my parents, you guys have seen my parents in my vlogs. A lot of like, I feel like their their personalities kind of show through in my vlogs. They're not like scary, mean people, but for some reason, like I really struggle with that. And I think it was just my own um, anxiety. So yeah, I can't remember exactly if I did write my parents a letter about my mental health or something. And that's also what kind of sparked it. But all I know is that freshman year of high school, I can't remember if it was before I had actually started high school, like during that summer, or if it was like actually during the year, but it was somewhere around freshman year of high school. My parents made me an appointment to see a therapist. And I remember it was this um, somewhat older white lady and she was practicing out of her home. She had like a front office in her home. And I just remember going over there and doing like an evaluation where I had to like do these surveys and take these tests. And I think looking back on it, I think I was being evaluated for like ADHD, maybe even like autism or just whatever types of evaluations that she was able to do to kind of see like where I was at on all these different spectrums and what I could possibly be struggling with. I remember there was like a, you know, a written part to it. But then of course she also wanted to just like talk to me and ask me what was going on. And from what I remember, she basically diagnosed me with clinical depression and something along the lines of anxiety. I can't remember exactly how she put it. If she said like, Maybe she said like an acute anxiety disorder. I remember the anxiety part of it was like not as big of a deal in her opinion, but she definitely said like, you are depressed. And I feel like I really did not see this therapist for very long at all. I feel like I only went to her a couple of times. And all I remember from those sessions is she would ask me questions about my feelings and I would cry a lot. And I would not feel like I was getting anything helpful from her and I would leave and just feel this weird, uncomfortable feeling after leaving. Like, just like, what, what did that even do? Because she did not prescribe me any medication because she was not a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist is the one who prescribes you, right? I always get that confused, but she was like more of just a therapist, a counselor. So she was not going to be prescribing me anything. She was just going to be, you know, working with me verbally. And I just remember feeling like this isn't doing anything. Like what, what, what am I here for? This is just making me cry. This is just bringing up a lot of stuff. And then I have to, then my parents have to pick me up and I have to get in the car after crying. It's just like, was just this awkward feeling. That's all I remember is it feeling like awkward and not helpful. And again, I did not see her for very long. I don't remember why I stopped seeing her. If it was because I said that I didn't like it and I felt like it was not helpful. And I asked my parents to not schedule any more appointments or if my parents also thought that it was not helpful. I don't remember whose idea it was, but I stopped seeing that lady. And for the rest of high school, that was freshman year, I'm pretty sure. And for the rest of high school, from what I can remember, I never saw any other therapist. I never did any other treatment. I never got on medic. I never saw a psychiatrist to get on medication. I never had any other form of therapy or treatment for my mental health. But I definitely was still struggling with my mental health all throughout high school. Like at that point now it's like, okay, I know I've been told by a professional that I am depressed and that I have anxiety. Um, I'm starting to learn more about these different symptoms and things like through Tumblr and through other, you know, things on the internet. And so now I know like, okay, I know what it is. So at least that's helpful. But I wasn't getting any help for it. I was not doing anything about it except for just trying to like power through it. And I don't think that that's good. Um, I don't know. I don't really know what was going through my parents' mind at the time. 
I don't know if there's something that I'm just not remembering that they did try to do to help me. I don't know if I did not do a good job of really expressing to them that I needed more help. It's a lot of things. It's a lot of things. And again, this was, you know, uh, over 10, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So it's not like, it wasn't like how it is today. These days, mental health is a huge topic of conversation. You know, you hear ads all the time for like better help, online therapy. You, it's just something that's just more commonly known and there's just more resources, it seems like. But I feel like back then it just wasn't talked about as much and there just wasn't, Like it just wasn't an automatic thing where it's like, okay, you're struggling with this. Here's what you do. So I don't really blame my parents for not doing more. Um, And I definitely don't blame myself for not doing more either because it's just like nobody really knew what to do. Um, So I definitely went untreated for the remainder of high school. And, you know, that wasn't great because it kind of set me up for college going into college and having my mental health be completely untreated. And now I'm going into yet another stressful, traumatic transition in my life. Like, you know, transitioning from middle school to high school was traumatic and it caused a a spike in my panic attacks and stuff like that. Now I'm transitioning from high school to college and it's the same thing. It's like, I am triggered by stress. I am triggered by the anxiety of new environments, new people, new responsibilities, not knowing what's about to happen. And I definitely started having panic attacks and having spikes in my depression, spikes in my anxiety in college. Um, I would get really worked up about my schoolwork, worked up about friends, worked up about relationships. And again, it's like, yeah, that's normal. It's normal to be upset when something goes wrong with your your boyfriend your boyfriend cheats on you like it's normal to be upset it's normal to be upset if you have drama within your friend group but for me it's like everything was just times a hundred and because I was untreated and because I was not actively talking to anybody about it or getting any help for it um and because also mental health still wasn't talked about that that much at the time like back in 2011 um because that was like 10 years ago I still felt like I even though I knew like this is a this this is a I don't want to call what what am I trying to say this is a medical issue technically you know what I mean like I am clinically depressed there is something going on with the chemicals in my brain it's just, it's like something that I can't help. Just like people can't help that they have cancer. People can't help that they have certain diseases. I can't help the fact, like, it's not my fault, basically. It's not my fault that I struggle with depression and anxiety and things like that. It's not something that I'm, like, doing wrong. But even though I knew that, I still felt like an outsider or a weirdo or like there's just something wrong with me like what is wrong with me like why why basically was my question like even though technically I knew why it didn't really feel like I knew why it still felt like it just still felt like I'm so different than everyone else. You know what I mean? Like, why are my emotions 10 times stronger than everyone else? Why do I feel so low? Why do I feel so weak? Why do I feel so easily triggered by certain things? Why do I feel like I just cannot get out of bed? I just cannot get my work done. There's just so many things that I feel like I can't do. I can't bring myself to do it. I can't get out of this funk. I can't, you know, I want to be happy. I want to be more positive. I want to be able to just focus on being thankful for my life and for what I have. I have a great life. I have tons of things going for me. Like, why can't I just focus on that and be happy? Like, why do I feel so depressed for no reason? reason when I don't really have any real reason to be depressed like my life is good and I would always feel such an immense amount of guilt for my depression specifically because I would just have days where I just felt like my life was not worth living and I felt so down about myself and down about my life but then 
I would be like, but why? You have a good life. You have a roof over your head. You have plenty of food to eat. You have both of your parents in your life supporting you. You have friends. You have your sim. You know, you have all this stuff that people would kill to have. You have a good, healthy, safe, normal life. Why are you depressed? Why are you sitting there thinking that your life is not worth living? Why do you feel so horrible about yourself and your life when? You should feel good. You should feel happy. You should be thankful. You know what I mean? Like I just would feel, I already just felt bad because of the depression itself, but then I would feel twice as bad because of the guilt of feeling bad in the first place. And it would just be this vicious cycle of like a lot of self-hate. It turned into this really deep self-hate of like, I I already have this baseline of hating myself because of the depression, but because I have depression, I hate myself even more. And because I hate myself, I hate myself for hating myself. It just like keeps layering on because it's giving me, it's this cycle of giving myself reasons to not like myself. And it was really hard, impossible even to break out of that mental cycle of these thoughts like circling around my head. And I would just would have days where I would get caught in that circle of thoughts caught in that circle of thoughts, can't break out of it. And that's what causes, you know, I'm not going to speak for other people, but that's what would cause me to be on the verge, not quite, but on the verge of feeling suicidal. Because if I can't break out of this horrible negative cycle of how I feel about myself and my life, then my life is not worth living. This is no way to live, to, to so deeply hate yourself You can't enjoy anything when you hate yourself. And that's what I really started struggling with in college. And it really showed through in more ways than one. It really showed through in the decisions that I made. It showed through in my lifestyle. If you guys, because nowadays I'm known for being like, oh, Virgo vibes, like organized and clean and everything is like so aesthetic and organized and, and cute. And like, I keep my house really nice and I keep everything like, so um, nicely taken care of. And that's kind of my thing that I'm known for now. If y'all would have saw how I lived in college, you would be appalled. You would be flabbergasted. I used to live like a hoarder and I'm not using that word in a funny way. Literally, like when you watch an episode of Hoarders and there you can't see the ground because the ground is covered in so much shit. And there's just trash and clothes and boxes and things are toppled over and stuff is just left out and unfinished. Like you would walk into my room in my college um, apartment, especially in like 2012, 2013, when things were like real bad, you could walk into my room at any given point and not be able to walk into my room because that was just like a physical representation of where my mental health was at. I could not bring myself to even just take care of myself, take care of my room. Um, I also was dealing with really severe cystic acne at the time. And I actually think that part of the reason why my acne was so bad was probably because my stress levels were super high. And there was just probably so much stuff going on inside of my body that was also causing inflammation in my skin. Um, There was other reasons for my acne as well, but I think that was probably part of it. Then on top of that, when I was really in my like depressive episodes, not only was I not taking care of my space, taking care of my room and just living in filth, but I wasn't taking care of myself, not wanting to get up and shower, not wanting to get up and wipe my makeup off, not doing my skincare routine. When I'm, my face is covered in acne and I'm sleeping in my makeup. And I'm not taking a shower and I'm not washing my face. So obviously that just made it worse. But then it's this cycle because when my acne gets worse, I look at myself in the mirror and I hate myself even more. And I say, what's the point? Look at my face. What is the point of even trying to take care of my skin? It doesn't matter if I wash my face today or not. Look at my skin. And I would just be in this cycle of just not loving myself, not taking care of myself in a physical sense, like when it comes to my room, when it comes to my skin, my hygiene, but then also in the sense of like my relationships. If you guys have been watching my channel, if you guys have been listening to my podcast, you know that I have been in a series of 
toxic relationships and I have never had (laughs) a nice boyfriend. I have never had a healthy relationship ever in my life. Um, And part of that is because how, you know, it's the age old saying, if you don't love yourself, how do you expect anybody else to love you? If you don't have self-respect, you're not going to have a good experience with dating. And I did not have an ounce of self-love. Self-respect, I think, is different. Respecting yourself and loving yourself, they do go hand in hand, but they're kind of different. Um, So I don't know. I think in a sense, what kind of got me through is that I did still have at least a little bit of self-respect to not get myself in like really, really bad situations. But I know for a fact that I did not have enough self-love because when you look at the guys that I dated, when you look at how I let them treat me, that purely came from, I think that I am disgusting. I think that I am a waste of space half the time. So I'm just glad that any anybody, any man, any guy, the fact that this guy is interested in me, that's good enough for me. It's like, I'm desperate. It comes from a place of desperation, Um, desperate for a distraction, a distraction away from my self-hate, a distraction away from my depression, away from my anxiety, feeling anxious when I'm alone, feeling depressed when I'm alone. I would rather have that company around me to distract me. I would rather have a boy come over instead of being in my room by myself. You know what I mean? So mental health really plays a huge role in dating, a huge role in a lot of different ways. People, you know, I think would look at me and judge me and be like, you just had no self-respect. You're just dumb. Like, why would you ever date that guy? Why would you take him back? He did this to you. Why would you take him back? Why would you keep dating him after that? Why would you invite him over? Why would you give him a second chance? Why were you even dating him in the first place? I was struggling with a lot of shit internally that made me really desperate for attention, love, distraction. Again, anything to kind of help take away from what I was dealing with mentally inside my own head. That's really where most of that came from. Now, obviously, at the time, did I know that that's what I was doing? No. At the time, I was just trying to survive. At the time, I'm just, it's all a blur in the moment. Hindsight is 2020. I'm able to look back on it and say, oh, the reason why I did that is because of this. The reason why I let him do that is because of this. I'm able to look back on it now and say that at the time, I just was, I don't know. I have no idea what I was thinking at the time. Just literally just trying to get through life. You know what I mean? But yeah, I had two really bad relationships in college and then a few little entanglement situationships mixed in between that were also just as bad. And then that also becomes a vicious cycle because I'm, you know, allowing myself to be in these relationships because I'm depressed. But then when the relationship goes bad and I get mistreated, that's a trigger. That's trauma. If I'm being abused in the relationship, that's trauma. What does that do? Makes the depression and anxiety worse. Gives you PTSD. So it's just this cycle of always bringing it back to the mental health, always bringing it back to it's making my symptoms worse. And I'm just in this vicious cycle. And I remember there were a couple of times where I was especially triggered, um, I remember this one instance with one of the guys that I dated in college. We got into a physical altercation. It got really bad. Police were called just, you know, abusive, toxic situation. And that really triggered me. Um, That was a traumatic event that triggered me that caused me to have a panic attack. And I remember calling my mom panicking, hyperventilating, not being able to catch my breath, just fully having a full like mental break. And um, she wasn't really able to do much for me over the phone. But then I think it was after that, that I realized that there was a counselor on campus for the students to talk to. And so I went to the counselor as like an emergency. I need to talk to like a counselor or a therapist because I'm really struggling. And I remember he was like this older white guy, like he looked like Santa Claus, had a long white beard. And I remember going in there, 
talking to him, explaining to him, like, this is what's going on with my relationship. And I struggle with depression and stuff anyway. And I just have feel whatever I told him, you know, I'm feeling really bad right now. I need help. I just remember, again, very similar to the lady that I saw in high school, which mind you, this is now only my second counselor because it was just that one time in high school or that one lady in high school that I saw a few times. Nothing, 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 nothing all the way until now. I think this was this was maybe sophomore year of college. So there was years in between that I never saw a counselor or anything. Now I'm finally seeing this counselor on my college campus. But I remember my experience with him was just like the experience with that lady from high school. It just felt very unhelpful. It felt like there was no, I just wasn't getting anything from it. You know what I mean? I just remember like venting to him, crying, crying, crying. He was asking me questions and I don't even, I couldn't tell you what he told me. I couldn't tell you. I, nothing stuck with me. I'm sure he tried to give me some advice or something. I couldn't tell you. It was not powerful. It was not meaningful enough for me to remember it. And I remember leaving from that appointment feeling like, okay, well, that was a waste. At the same time, I guess it kind of calmed me down enough to get through that day, get through the rest of the week and figure out something to do to just get through the rest of my life. So I guess in that sense, it kind of served its purpose to keep me from doing anything too crazy that day, but it wasn't helpful in the long term. And so that was definitely not, um, I think maybe I saw him one other time after that, but that definitely wasn't like a long term solution. So again, I went a very long time after that, not seeing a therapist, not seeing a counselor, psychiatrist, nothing, no medication, no nothing, just no treatment after that again. But I continued to struggle with my mental health. I continued to make bad life decisions. I continued to have all different types of struggles in all different areas of my life that all connected back to being depressed, being anxious, having panic attacks, not loving myself, not being confident, not like... So much happened in my life that now looking back on it, I'm like, it was because of my mental health. If maybe, if maybe, if only I had gotten more help, I had gotten more treatment, I had gotten, if only I had gotten my mental health more under control during that time, who knows how different my life would have been? Who knows how many bad situations and struggles and who knows what all could have been avoided now? At the same time, we all know about the butterfly effect. So if my life would have been different in that moment, where would I be today? I wouldn't be sitting here today, most likely. It would have led my life down a whole different trajectory. And, you know, I am grateful for where I'm at today. So if I could, would I change it? I don't know. That's a hard question because I I like where I am right now. But at the same time, if I could go back in time and save my younger self from that stress and trauma, I would want to. I just, it just would be really interesting to see how that would change my whole life up until present day. But anyway, I'm just saying that to say so much happened back then that probably could have been avoided if I would have had better treatment. One big thing in particular was the relationship that ended up with me accidentally getting pregnant and there's a lot of trauma and a lot of negativity surrounding that whole situation and I have yet to tell you guys that whole story um I guess I'll kind of dive into it a little bit now so again I used relationships in college as a distraction I used them as a security blanket as something to soothe my my negative emotions feeling depressed and sad and lonely and anxious like it just made me feel better to have that attention have that person around and because I did not love myself I wasn't too picky with who that person was which like I said led me to be in some very bad relationships so I ended up in a relationship with the father of my child in college after my first really bad college boyfriend feeling super depressed because he, the first boyfriend dumped me and that ended up triggering me and triggering a depressive 
downward spiral, you know, a depressive episode that put me in a really bad, negative, vulnerable place of just feeling so sad and lonely and just feeling so horrible about myself because he made me feel really horrible. I already felt horrible about myself, but then that dude also went out of his way to make me feel horrible about myself. Also at that time, I was dealing with some stuff with my friends because my main friends were my roommates, but they were all going on their own different life path at this time. So they were in their own relationships, you know, leaving and moving in with their boyfriend or graduating early and moving to another city. Like I kind of felt just extra lonely in that moment because it felt like my only friends weren't really around. I just got dumped. He made me feel even worse about myself than I already did. I struggle with depression anyway. Like I just, you know, I don't want to make it seem like I'm making excuses for myself, but I genuinely had like multiple layers of things going on in my head that put me in this position to look at this new guy who came along and be like, okay, yeah, this is better than nothing. Yeah, this is what I need right now to distract myself and make myself feel better. So that's how that relationship started. And it was toxic, <laughs> like for almost off top, it was toxic. It was negative. It was um, mentally and emotionally abusive. You know what I mean? I was being mistreated. I was being cheated on. I was being humiliated and I was taking him back because I was desperate, because I wanted that attention and that distraction. And um, it eventually led to me graduating, moving out of my college apartment, moving um, downtown Dallas. The original plan was that I was going to move and have my best friend be my roommate. But again, my friends are all on their own life path. That did not end up working out. My friend ended up needing to go down a different path. And so I was left to live. um, If I wanted to live where I wanted to live, I would have to live there by myself. That was very triggering for me. That was very scary. That spiked my anxiety. I had never lived by myself ever. The idea of living in a new city and a whole new vibe after graduation, again, it's this whole transitional thing. This is a theme in my life. When I transition, whenever there's a big transition from one phase of life to a new phase of life, you can bet that I'm going to have a panic attack. So I'm panicking. I don't want to be by myself. I thought I was going to live with my best friend. Then came in the idea of, well, I do have my boyfriend my toxic boyfriend who I've been off and on with and having this horrible toxic relationship the whole time. The only reason why I ever started dating him is because I was depressed and lonely and vulnerable, but I have him and he's who I feel like he's the only person that I have right now. So, okay, let me just make sure I keep him around because that'll, that'll be my security blanket. That will make me feel better. So that's what I did. I, without really officially saying it, I planned for him to live with me. That way I could live where I wanted to live, but I wouldn't have to be by myself. And, um, so I moved into that apartment and shortly after that, actually kind of like at the same time as I was moving into that new apartment, I found out that I was pregnant completely on accident. It was a complete slip up, complete blip with the birth control and blah, blah, blah. It was not on purpose. I was not trying to get pregnant. I was not, I never thought to myself, this is the man that I want to have a baby with. I thought to myself, this is the man who I want to keep around for now because I don't want to be by myself in this new city. That's all I was thinking, honestly, at the time. I never saw him as my future husband. I never saw him as the father of my children. I never was trying to get pregnant, but I got pregnant. Surprisingly, when I first found out I was pregnant, I actually just went numb. I didn't have a panic attack. I didn't have this huge spike of extreme emotions. Knowing my history, that would be what you would expect, but I actually just went completely numb. I remember just feeling empty feeling like no thoughts in my head, no nothing. I think it was like I was so overwhelmed that my body had to just shut down. I think it was almost like my body wanted to have such a big panic attack 
that it knew it couldn't do that. So it just like shut down instead. Like, I don't know. It was, it was almost as if the feeling was too big for my body to even express. So I just went numb. Like I said, I was kind of halfway living with um, my boyfriend at the time. And we found out that I was pregnant together. I took the test with him. He actually saw the test first before me. He looked at it first. So we both knew I was pregnant. He knew right away. Some days had passed by. And I don't want to dive too much into the details just for a lot of reasons. I hope you guys can respect that. But essentially, him and I got into it because he he betrayed me. He did something that he promised not to do. And I called him out on it. But he retaliated with anger and it got physical. And again, without giving too many details, um, because honestly, it's still like hard for me to talk about. And this is not something I've ever talked about publicly at all, really. Um, So without giving too many details, it got to the point where I was fearing for my life and I was screaming for help, but there was nobody around to help me. And eventually it, it was over and I was hurt. You know, I was physically hurt. I had injuries, but I wasn't, it wasn't like my life was, um, on the line. And, um, after it was all said and done, I knew that I needed to call the police and I needed to call my mom. Those were the first two things that I thought to do. Um, he left, or at least I thought he left. I wasn't sure if he was still in the vicinity or if he was fully gone. I still wasn't sure of my safety. I just, it's really hard. I don't want it, to, it's hard to explain without giving y'all this, the step-by-step play-by-play. So many thoughts running through my mind because I literally had just found out that I was pregnant and I had never planned to be pregnant in the first place. So first of all, finding out about an unplanned pregnancy you can only, if it's something you haven't experienced, I'm sure you can imagine the stress, the anxiety, the thoughts that run through your head when you find something like that out. On top of that, add in the fact that this guy is not who I saw myself with in the future. I never, I didn't, I actually was planning on breaking up with him pretty soon. I was trying to get to a point where I felt strong enough to be by myself because I knew that the relationship was never good. I knew that this was a relationship that I should not be in. I already knew that. And so like right before I found out I was pregnant, I was really trying to build up the courage to break up with him once and for all, because we had been so off and on, but I was really trying to build up the courage to fully and finally break up with him and just be okay with being single, be okay with being by myself, living by myself and try to like heal in that area of my life. But then I found out I was pregnant by him. So that obviously threw a wrench in my plans. So it's finding out that I'm pregnant and it was a surprise, unplanned. I don't want to say the word unwanted, but in a sense, unwanted by a man who I was trying to break up with, who I don't want to be with anymore, who I know I shouldn't be with. Layered on top with this physical altercation And then layering on top just my own mental health issues that I've been struggling with this whole time. And then layering on top the fact that like nobody even knows that I'm pregnant yet. My mom doesn't even know. We've told no one. So all those thoughts and then some are racing through my mind. This is minutes after this altercation just happened. And I'm bleeding and things are broken and my heart is racing and I'm crying and I'm thinking about all these things. And in that moment, I had one of the worst panic attacks of my entire life. And I've had some bad ones, but this one is probably the worst one that I've ever had to date. I mean, I could not, I thought I was going to die just from the panic attack itself. But I was just like so scared and so like just the emotions were so strong. The fear was so strong. The anxiety was so strong. 
I was scared about being pregnant. I was scared about telling my mom. I was scared of what just happened. And is he coming back? And is he going to like, it just, it's so hard to put it into words, but I was hyperventilating. I could not catch my breath. I was shaking. I was on the floor. It was horrible. It was a horrible feeling. And then mixed into that, I was having these really, really depressed suicidal thoughts. Um, I think technically you would call it suicidal ideation where it's like, you're not actively trying to commit suicide, but you're thinking about it. You're starting to think about what you would do. You're starting to think about your plan. You're starting to think about what can I do right now to kill myself? Um, and I, at the time lived on the 22nd floor of a tall downtown apartment building and my windows did open and I remember thinking about not attempting not getting I didn't get up and walk over to the window I didn't open the window I didn't do anything but I sat there in my room and I looked at the window and I thought about the fact that I could just open the window and I could just jump out and this would all be over. I believe I was 21 years old when this was happening. So, you know, I have been struggling for, you know, almost 10 years at this point, but I had never really fully struggled with um, suicidal thoughts, suicidal ideation, never once attempted suicide. Suicide was not my biggest struggle. Through it all, you know, I struggled a lot, but I always had something keeping me away from the idea of suicide. I think it was my guilt, honestly. I think because I struggled so much with guilt, the idea of taking my own life made me feel extremely guilty because I would think about like what that would do to my loved ones. How would my friends and family feel if they found me? You know what I mean? It just felt like it wasn't an option because I I felt too guilty to even consider it. Um, So this was the first time that I really, really contemplated it. There was definitely still times in the past that I thought about it. Like I would think about it up to the point of feeling guilty and then not letting myself go there. But this was the first time that I didn't feel guilty. The feeling was strong enough to surpass the guilty feeling. And that was scary because the guilt was the only thing keeping me from doing it in the past. You know what I mean? Now it's like, fuck the guilt. Fuck what anybody, fuck how anybody else feels. I feel these emotions so strongly that I don't care. I don't care if my friends are hurt by my, by losing me. I don't care if my family is devastated by losing me. I feel so strongly about how I feel right now that I am actually thinking and considering my options as far as I could just open that window and jump. And that was really scary because it was like so tempting. It was so possible. It was real. Like it wasn't just you know, times in the past where I would be laying in my bed, almost daydreaming is a weird way to put it, but like daydreaming about not existing. I don't know how else to explain it. Dreaming about being able to somehow magically disappear off the face of the earth without actually having to kill myself and without having to put my friends and family through the loss. Like that's something I would think about. I would imagine what it would be like to just not exist. And I would dream about that. And I would wish that there was a way to just not exist without actually having to commit suicide. And that's one thing, but it's another thing to be in a situation where you're actually ideating. You're actually thinking about it. And the fact that I felt myself thinking about it in that moment, I felt myself actually getting up to that point was so scary. It was like, this is a new level. This is a new level for me. And I just was panicking and freaking out, like I said. And so long story short, um, I did call the police. That's like a whole nother thing in and of itself. The, the, 
the legal side of it or whatever. But I also, I called my mom cause I didn't know who else to call. I didn't have friends in the city. I didn't have anyone that I could say, Hey, come over. Like the only person that I knew to turn to was my mom. And so I called her and I was crying and hyperventilating and she's like, what's wrong? What happened? And I'm like, I'm explaining to her what physically just happened. You know, the altercation that just happened in the police and blah, 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 blah. And I'm hurt. I'm injured. I don't know if he's still here. I'm scared. I'm scared for my life. I'm explaining all of that. But then in the same breath, I also had to tell her that I was pregnant because I was worried about my pregnancy. You know, I was worried about the the physical health of my pregnancy. I hadn't told her yet. That was also part of the reason why I was freaking out. And so all in the same breath, I'm telling her about the physical altercation. And I also told her, and on top of that, I'm pregnant. And I just laid it on her. And she just was like, oh my God. And at the time I was in Dallas, she was in Austin. That's almost like a three to four hour drive. She just was like, hold on, I'm coming. So she dropped everything, got on the road. About three hours later, she showed up to my apartment. During that three hours, it was just a three hour panic attack, just nonstop bawling my eyes out. And then you know, the suicidal ideation sitting there, I'm in, I'm on the 22nd floor with all these windows, like the way my apartment was, there was just like a whole wall of windows that all opened. And I had to, I remember being in my bed, like trying to like almost restrain myself and just being like, don't stand up. Don't even stand up. Don't even stand up. And I just like kept my legs crossed and my arms crossed and I was crying and hyperventilating and gagging and just like trying to just restrain myself and keep myself from like passing out. Um, I may have even passed out at one point. I don't remember, but it was like three hours that went by um, until my mom showed up. And she just was like, "We, I got to get you out of here. I got to get you back to Austin. Um, you don't need to be here anyway because I don't know where he is or what he's about to do or what's going on between y'all two. But you do not need to be here. Um, at the time, I think he still had a key to my apartment and I wasn't sure. Like it just was not a safe place for me to be in my own apartment. So she was like, for that reason, you need to come home with me to Austin. But also like we need to get you some help, like blah, blah, blah. So Packed up like some of my stuff real quick, like an overnight bag, jumped in the car with my mom. And as soon as we got back into Austin, my mom took me to the hospital. Like, I don't know what exact hospital it was. And this was my first time ever being taken to a hospital. I have never broken a bone. I have never had any like medical issues ever in my life. Any reason to go to the ER, any reason to go to the hospital. Like I've never experienced that type of medical hospital situation. And so just being taken to the hospital period gave me anxiety, started spiking up the panic attack again, because I'm like, this is scary. I don't know if any of you guys can relate to this, but like hospitals are scary. Doctors and anything like that is scary, especially if you've never experienced it before and they're taking you in and they're like, it's just, it's a scary thing. And it was something that I had never experienced. Um, So I started kind of panicking about that. And then I also was just not in my right mind. So honestly, A lot of it is a blur up until I just remember being called in to speak to someone in like an office setting, like a desk. And it was, I guess, a psychiatrist or I don't know what person this was, what type of doctor this was that I was speaking to. Um, But my mom brought me in to speak to them. And I remember they were like they had like a clipboard and they were asking me a list of questions. And this is again, this is my first time ever experiencing this the only similar thing that I had experienced was at the nice old ladies therapy you know practice back in high school where it was like a comfortable setting and she just was asking me these questions all nice whatever but this was different this was like scary and like a doctor in a doctor's office and like going down this clipboard and I don't even know what all questions they were asking me but I remember one specific question they asked me was have you ever commit or have you ever contemplated I think the wording was something like have you ever contemplated suicide have you ever attempted suicide and I said I remember I said no I've never attempted suicide because that's true I've never physically done anything to actually physically 
try to hurt myself or kill myself. But I said, yes, I have contemplated it. I have thought about it. And I just remember after that, everything was a blur. It was like, in my mind, the way I remember it, I'm, I'm pretty sure this didn't happen in real life, but the way I remember it was like being restrained, being grabbed and being like, you need to go into inpatient. The doctor being like, oh, you answered yes to that question, time to go. And everything just was happening so fast. Everything was a blur. Next thing I know, I'm in a different facility Come to find out this is the psych ward. I think it was a whole different building, like a whole different location from the first hospital. I think it was like a separate mental hospital, but it was a psych ward and I'm being brought into the psych ward and they're telling me, take everything off. It was like, it was so traumatic because I've never even been to a hospital, a, just a regular hospital for regular medical issues, let alone a mental hospital let alone like the psych ward. So this was all very jarring and very scary. And then also because I'm already in a very like sensitive state to begin with. And I have so many things going through. I haven't even had time to process my pregnancy in and of itself, which is like traumatic in and of itself. And then there's so many things happening back to back to back to back to back. And so it was all a blur, but I do remember the intake feeling like I was going to jail. The intake for the mental hospital, they were like, take everything off. You have to take out all your piercings. You can't have any laces in your shoes. Like they gave me like these like scrubs type of outfit to put on and the the infamous grippy socks to put on because you can't have your normal like shoes and socks. I had to take out all my piercings. Um, they like searched me down and patted me down and like took all my stuff away from me and then like showed me to my room. And it was like, a glorified jail cell. It was two plain beds in there, no other furniture, no other nothing. And then a very plain, weird looking bathroom that had like specialty stuff so that you couldn't hurt yourself and you couldn't, like it looked like jail. I've never been to jail and I'm sure it's still much better than jail. But from from my limited experience, from my limited life experience, this was the closest thing to jail. And it was as scary and as horrible as jail for me in that moment. And come to find out, I had been admitted into inpatient because I was like technically on suicide watch because I had said, yes, I've contemplated suicide. That's what like trigger the doctors to be like, oh, you need to be taken in to the psych ward and we're going to keep you overnight for several days to evaluate you, to do, I don't know. I didn't know what they were going to do. And I don't, I still to this day don't fully understand how it works, but my parents were not allowed. I was not allowed to sign myself out. So I was not free to go whenever I wanted to go. I was locked in there and I was not allowed to leave. My parents were also not allowed to to take me home. They were not allowed to come and be like, oh, we, we want to sign her out. That was not an option. The only person who could let me leave was the doctors. The doctors had to like give the green light to be like, okay, she's good. She can leave. So I was stuck in there until further notice. And I didn't know how many days. I didn't know what they, I didn't imagine going into a place and you don't even know what they're about to do to you or why you're in there or for how long you're going to be in there. It was so scary. And then it was just like the movies. Like the only experience I had ever had with a mental hospital is what you see in the cliche movies of, ooh, the scary psych ward. There's all these crazy people in the psych ward up and going up and down the halls and like being violent and screaming. And, you know, in the movies, they make it seem so scary and dramatic. And I would think to myself like, oh, that's just exaggerated. But no, it was really like that. It was really like that. There were people in there who were struggling with all types of issues, all types of mental health issues, some of which were severe, some of which were very, very severe. And when somebody has severe mental health issues, they can be violent. They can be completely out of control. It can get to a point where it takes several people to pin them down and control them. I saw some scary shit in there. I felt 
so afraid 24 seven because I just felt like I had to watch my back. I felt like I could be attacked at any moment. I'm pregnant. They would have literally times where like a siren would go off and they would be on the loudspeaker, like code orange, code orange, you know, two people are fighting or somebody attacked someone. Like it was so loud and chaotic and scary and like random people would come up to me and try to mess with me and try to talk to me like and then I had to go to sleep in this scary dark room by myself and be locked in there and I'm not allowed to even it was I can't even put it into words I know I'm getting really worked up but it was so scary it was so so scary so traumatic to this day, one of the most traumatic things I have ever experienced in my life. Again, I have never been to jail. I have never been to prison. I know it's probably not a fair comparison, but again, that's what it felt like to me. And they were very dead set on medicating me. That was like their first goal. Their first priority was, okay, let's evaluate you. Let's get you on some type of medication. But I'm like, I'm pregnant. So they had to be very careful about what they were prescribing me. They ended up prescribing me, I think, two or three things. And it was mandatory. Like, it's it's like uh, you get called, line up for, for medicine time and you have to take this medicine. And we are going to check all in your mouth and check under your tongue to make sure that you take this medicine. I've always been kind of weird about prescriptions and medicine. Up until this point, I had never been on prescription meds for anything not for mental health and I've always been kind of iffy about that because there can be really bad side effects and like I don't know I just don't really trust it I'm the type of person who I don't even barely take Tylenol or ibuprofen just because I'm just kind of weird about it so me knowing I'm pregnant and not having any experience with any of these prescription drugs and having this doctor be like, you need to take these three prescriptions and you have to, and we're not even going to barely tell you any information about it. Like that was very triggering for me. Um, I believe I took it. I didn't have a choice. I think it was maybe for like two days that um, I had to take the medicine until finally. And I remember like, it was just like in jail, you would get like, one phone call a day for however many minutes and I would call my parents and be like please get me out of here like please find a way like I don't want to be in here this is not where I belong this is not helpful like I don't need to be on suicide watch I'm not gonna kill myself like just begging for them to figure out a way to, to rescue me from this place like every day I would call them and they were I think on their end trying to figure out like what they needed to do um until finally, I don't even remember what ended up happening or if it was just the fact that I finally got cleared by the doctor. Hey, it's me chiming in from the future. I went ahead and did a little bit of research so I could be more accurate with this. I think what I experienced is called a code 302, where due to the doctor's opinion on your mental state, they are able to involuntarily keep you in the mental hospital facility for a maximum of 72 hours. So if I'm not mistaken, I believe I stayed there for three days. And after the third day, that was the max time that they could keep me involuntarily. So that's when I was able to leave. They finally were like, okay, Raven, you're leaving today. And I was like, oh my God, like that was the best. I felt like I was getting out of jail, literally. And I remember my dad came to pick me up and I was so, so relieved. Um, but other than all the scariness in there, the only other stuff I remember is like, we would have group therapy sessions, individual therapy sessions, talking with your doctor about your prescriptions, you know, organized meal time, organized recreational time where I would just sit in the room with the other people and they would like have a TV on. It wasn't like, oh, making friends and like, oh, having it like, it was very traumatic, very scary and not helpful at all. Even like the therapy sessions or the the sessions where I was talking to a doctor or, or a counselor, like that was not helpful. I didn't gain a single resource, a single piece of advice, a single, I didn't gain anything positive from my experience in that psych ward. I gained nothing but trauma from that situation. And I still have nightmares about it to this day. I still have nightmares about it to this day because it was so scary. 
it was so scary. And now I know, like, they made me hyper aware that if I ever do speak to a mental health professional again, I know that I'm never even going to bring up the word suicide. I'm going to be very careful about what I say to any doctors or professionals because I never want to be thrown into a psych ward ever again. I never felt like I belonged in there, like I needed to be in there. I never felt like that's what I needed in that moment. What I needed in that moment is just like my, I needed a community of love and support around me. Yes, maybe I needed professional help. I think like that's fair, but like to put me in inpatient in the psych ward and like maybe it was just that specific psych ward that I was in. And I honestly, I I wish I knew like the name off the top of my head so I could literally tell y'all the name and literally be like, please avoid this place at all costs. Because I don't know if that specific place um, was just a really bad one with really bad doctors, but Or if they're all like that, like, I don't know. I don't know. But it was really, it was really, really traumatic and really, really scary. And I still have nightmares about it to this day because it's like a horror movie, like being locked in a room and just, uh, I wish I could like show you guys the visuals of like what the place looked like and what it smelled like and what it felt like. And it was so cold and the people around you and the doctors, like it was so scary it was so so scary so anyway I left there just feeling relieved that I was out of there but gaining absolutely nothing positive from it I never took the prescriptions like I was supposed to keep taking those prescriptions I didn't take them because I didn't feel comfortable taking I was like I don't even know what this stuff is I don't know what it's gonna do to my body I'm pregnant I don't know what it's gonna do to my baby like so I did not ever take those prescriptions and it it really that whole experience really left a horrible taste in my mouth when it comes to like traditional western medicine specifically when it comes to mental health so it's like i never wanted to go to a normal psychiatrist ever again i never wanted to go to a normal mental health facility like a traditional like i said western medicine type of place i was like fuck y'all fuck these doctors fuck these like y'all are not trying to help people I don't believe that y'all are actually trying to help people. I believe that y'all are funneling people into a building to medicate them, to numb them. And you're not even keeping them safe and comfortable. You're making their mental health worse with this type of environment and this type of treatment. You don't care about these people. Like I felt really angry and really turned off by that whole situation. And so I started leaning a lot more towards a holistic, natural, kind of more crunchy approach. And my mom knew of this lady who I guess technically she's kind of like, she's just a a holistic doctor, I guess is the best way to explain it. And so I went to this holistic doctor to get checked out and she gave me a lot of insight and information and basically put me on a strict, um, supplement like natural supplements regimen where I was supposed to be taking like all these natural supplements every day because she's like you're low on this and you're low on that and you need more of this and this will help with your mental health and blah 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 blah. and so for a while there I was just like taking all these like vitamins but um it was just a lot to balance because I also had to think about my pregnancy and just everything else in my life, you know, the situation with my ex, you know, my daughter's dad, everything that was going on with him, because that continued to be a tumultuous, toxic, dramatic situation. Um, So I was dealing with a lot with him. I was dealing with a lot with just my own thoughts and feelings about my pregnancy. And then, you know, I had to think about work I, I just basically fell off the face of the earth for a little bit because I was in the mental hospital and I do social media for a living. And so normally I'm posting every day, you know, I'm up, I'm uploading, I'm updating my social media. Um, and I have to do that for work. You know, it's very important to stay consistent when you do social media for a living, but I had this lull in my content because 
of what I was going through and from being in the psych ward and stuff. And so I had to figure out how to start back posting without people knowing that I was really struggling with my mental health without people knowing that I was pregnant without people knowing that I was in an abusive relationship without people knowing that I was temporarily living with my parents again. Um, because at that point, after I got out of the mental hospital, I went back to my parents' house and I stayed with my parents for like at least a month, if not longer. So I wasn't even at my apartment in Dallas and I had just moved in. And so it was like, from y'all's perspective at the time, y'all expected me to just be like, oh, I just moved downtown. Like, here's my apartment for you. Like, you just expected my content to go on as normal whole time. You don't know that. Like I said, I just went to the mental hospital. I'm pregnant. I'm living with my parents. Like all this chaos is going on in real life, but I'm trying to make it look normal from my social media. And that was really stressful. And it was just, it just was a lot going on. And so admittedly, I didn't really do a good job of like keeping up with my vitamins and supplements that I was supposed to be taking or, you know, finding a a different counselor or therapist to talk to, or just, there was just still more that I think I could have done in that moment to take care of myself when it comes to my mental health, but it was like, there's too much else going on. You know what I mean? Um, and so after a while, it just kind of faded, like, I guess making my mental health a priority, like slowly started fading away. And I'm going throughout my pregnancy and there's just so much going on that like my mental health is not really a main priority. And I end up having my daughter and there was just, you know, life, life was happening. A lot of life things were happening, major things and taking care of my mental health just got put to the back burner and I never got a new therapist. I never just never really did anything after that. So fast forward from when Zaya, that was like when Zaya was first born, fast forward six years because Zaya is now six years old and I haven't really done too much over the past six years to take care of my mental health. Um, I kind of got to a place where I know what my diagnosis is. I know what my symptoms are. I know what most of my triggers are. I know what most, you know, what my traumas are. I know I have PTSD from certain things. Like I kind of know myself and I know what my struggles are. I don't have a cure for any of it. Um, I have a few coping mechanisms as far as just like, you know, things like journaling or meditating or realizing the connection between my physical health and my mental health. You know, if I'm not taking care of my body, literally, then my mental health is probably going to be bad. So, you know, making a more of an effort to take care of my body and stuff like that. Like, I don't know. It's hard to explain. I feel like I kind of just got to like a place where it's like, this is just my life. Like I have these struggles. They're not, they're not gone. I still struggle with these things. I still have panic attacks. I still struggle with depression. I still go go into dark depressive episodes every now and then. I still get really anxious about certain things and have like anxiety attacks. I still get triggered by certain things. I still have nightmares. I still have, you know, these symptoms of PTSD, but I haven't lately really been doing much about it other than just trying to like get through it. Just, I guess it's just kind of like, Hey, this is, this is something you're going to deal with. It's not going to kill you. You don't need, you, you've decided that you're not going to kill yourself over it. That you've decided that you're just going to live with it. This is you. This is who you are. These are your struggles. You're going to continually go through this cycle of sometimes having good days, 
But having a lot of bad days and having some really, really bad days, that's just your life. So it's almost just kind of being like, you know, when I do have a really bad day, just kind of being like, yeah, I have depression. Yes, I'm having a really bad day today because I have depression. I have PTSD. I have an anxiety disorder. This is me. This is what I have. Of course, I'm going to have bad days like this. I know it will eventually pass. I don't know how long this episode is going to last. It might be one day. It might be a week. It might be three weeks. It'll eventually pass. And I will go along the up and down roller coaster. That's kind of where I'm at right now. It's almost just kind of like accepting it and living with it and not trying so hard to cure it because I know that there is not a cure and not trying so hard to, it's almost like I got tired of fighting it. I got tired of fighting it. I tried some things that really backfired. I tried some things that I couldn't keep up with and I just got tired. And so currently, like, I just don't fight it. That's the best way I can explain it. I don't fight it. It is what it is. It's, it really sucks. It really still really sucks. And I really still struggle sometimes. But I just, I just kind of let it happen. And then eventually, I'm somewhat okay again. And then I'm not okay. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's the best way I can explain it. Um, I wish I had some better advice or some better resources that I could offer you like to be able to say okay currently here's what I'm doing here's what really works here's what really saves me when I'm having a panic attack here's what really helps with my depression here like I wish I had a list of like you know good advice to give you guys but I honestly truly really don't there's a couple of things again like journaling meditating eating healthy like basic things that I think everybody already knows and that most people have already tried Um, Those basic things. Yeah, I do try to use those things. But as far as some like, you know, more creative, more powerful piece of advice that I could give you, I really don't. I really don't have it for you. I don't have it for you. Um, Yeah. And I know that's kind of a depressing way to end this podcast. Again, I wish I had a more happy ending or a more happy way to like wrap it all up. But that's that's it. It's an ongoing thing. I, I think now I'm starting to get to a point again where I'm ready to fight again. I think I'm ready to put more effort into it. I think I am wanting to find more resources and to get more help. I think I am starting to finally, six years later, after having that traumatic experience in the mental hospital, now, six years later, I think I'm finally starting to be open to the idea of exploring traditional medicine for it. Because I've been so closed off to the idea of, like I said, regular doctors and prescription medications because I was so traumatized from that experience but now I'm starting to be a little bit more open to it and so I think pretty soon I will look into seeing a psychiatrist maybe being prescribed something maybe you know finding a therapist somebody that I can you know, talk to regularly. Cause right now I don't have a therapist. I don't have, I don't, I'm not seeing a holistic doctor. I'm not seeing a therapist. I'm not seeing a psychiatrist. I'm not, I'm not seeing anyone. I'm not doing anything of that nature when it comes to my mental health. I'm literally just, it's just me. It's just whatever I'm doing in my own house. You know what I mean? But like I said, I think I am probably going to look into it pretty soon. Cause I'm starting to like open up to the idea Um, so I guess stay tuned, stay tuned. I will definitely update you guys if, and when I do do that, um, this is a lifelong ongoing journey. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, uh, share those stories with you guys so that you guys know kind of the main ideas of where I'm coming from and what my main struggles are. And, um, if you guys have questions, definitely hit me up on my Instagram account, Raven Elise podcast. You can DM 
that Instagram ac- account to privately ask me questions. And um, that may spark another episode where I can like dive deeper into specific um, areas of this conversation. Other than that, like I said, I will definitely update you guys when I have updates when it comes to this topic. But that is all I have for this episode. So I will catch you guys in the next episode. Bye.